Laboratory for the Eye Learning Objectives for the Eye 1. Be able to recognize and describe the histologic details of the cornea, sclera, ciliary body, iris, lens, and retina. And 2. Be able to recognize and describe the histologic details of the neural retina. The wall of the eyeball consists of an outer corneal scleral coat, a central coat called the uvea, and an inner coat called the retina. The corneal scleral coat, uh, coat excuse me, is divided into a smaller transparent anterior region uh, known as the cornea to permit light to enter the eye and of course the sclera, that white portion of the eye, uh, this is made up, the sclera is made up of a tough uh, fibrous layer that protects the delicate internal structures of the eye and also helps maintain the shape of the eyeball. So the, as the name indicates the corneal scleral coat consists of a transparent anterior cornea in this rather opaque uh, scleral region. Now the ovial coat consists of a choroid, which is shown here as this little black line in this diagrammatic uh, picture, the ciliary body, and then finally continues on as the iris of the eye. The choroid layer is the vascular part of the uh, ovia and lies immediately beneath the retina. The retina itself, the innermost layer, consists of pigment containing photoreceptors that on exposure to light produce chemical energy that is then converted into an electrical energy of nerve impulses. And a chain of conducting neurons in the retina transmit the impulse to the optic nerve. Uh, the optic nerve collects about in this area. Uh, in an area known as the optic disc and that is the point where the nerves of the retina gather to actually form the optic nerve and leave the eyeball. The interior of the eyeball is subdivided into an anterior chamber, a posterior chamber which is shown here, and a huge vitriol cavity which is shown here. Each is filled with a transparent medium that helps maintain the shape and the turgor of the eye. The anterior and posterior chambers are continuous through the pupil which is about uh, this location uh, and contain a watery aqueous humor that provides the uh, nutrients for the anterior chamber of the eye. The large vitriol cavity behind the lens and filling the majority of the eye is filled with a viscous transparent gel called a vitreous humor or the vitreous body. And so this is sort of just the general overall picture outlay of some of the structures of the eye uh, showing how the eye is uh, put together in a rather general sense. It should also be pointed out that the neural retina, which is uh, shown right here at this location in this sort of stippled area, is actually only physically anchored at two major points. The so-called optic disc, this area here where the uh, nerve fibers of the retina are forming the optic nerve and exiting the eyeball by going through the sclera, and a point here where the nervous elements of the retina disappear and this region is known as the aura serrata, this little uh, region here. From this point on the retina does not contain uh, its uh, neural type elements. So this, these two points are the only physically anchoring points of the retina. Uh, the remainder of the retina lies on a pigment epithelium and on the ovia uh, and it's just held there by the sort of the vitreous body and the 
slight pressure, as it were, though it's not a true pressure. Uh, it, it keeps it uh, pushed against the other uh, walls of the eye. This is why uh, a detached retina can occur because of only these two, both posterior and anterior, are the only places where it is actually physically, that is the retina, anchored to the uh, remainder of the eyeball wall. This is a section through an entire human eye. Uh, so we're seeing it at sort of midway, cut along its uh, long axis. And it demonstrates the corneal scleral coat. The sclera is the heavy collagen is now uh, stained with a light blue dye. One can be seen at the arrow. The other aspect of it is out of, sort of out of reach at the uh, bottom of the field. One can see that it then becomes transparent in this particular uh, region. So this is the region of the cornea. Immediately behind the uh, cornea, as illustrated by the arrow, is the anterior chamber. This particular structure here is the lens. The ciliary body is located here and indicated by the arrow, as it is here. And this thin strand coming out in this particular direction and from over here is the iris as viewed in section. The pupil is where the tip of the arrow now resides. Though not shown at this magnification, the zonal fibers extend from the ciliary processes of the ciliary body and attach to the uh, lens, these uh, zonal fibers, and make the sort of a little ligament that attaches and holds the lens in position. So that being the case, this anterior chamber is located here on the inner, as one passes through the pupil be, before that suspensory ligament of the lens made up of the zonal fibers is the posterior uh, chamber of the eye. Both of these will be filled with the aqueous humor. The retina, as one can see here, has been pulled off and detached a little bit. And the same is true in the superior aspect of the eye. And fibers coming from the retina, that nerve fiber layer, will gather in here at the optic disc. And this is the exit point uh, of the optic nerve after it's once has formed. So this is the optic disc area. This entire chamber here is uh, referred to as the vitreous chamber and it contains the vitreous uh, component of the uh, eye or the vitreous body, a gelatinous uh, polysaccharide uh, type of material. This is a section of the uh, eye as seen with the scanning objective. What I plan to do is to course around the perimeter of the eye and just uh, pointing out various structures. This particular structure now in the occupying the field of view is a section through the cornea as seen at low power. The corneal epithelium which would be on the outside of the eye is indicated at the tip of the arrow. This large blue stained area is the substantia propria or the stroma of the cornea and barely visible a small layer of cuboidal cells is the corneal endothelium. The arrow now is residing in with the ant within the anterior chamber of the eye. Now, as one peruses and courses around the cornea of this human eye, one will see uh, shortly the substructure uh, will begin to change. And one can see a little bit uh, of a difference if we took an angle such as uh, right about here. This would be transparent cornea. 
this rougher textured uh, material is the sclera just coming into, or the white portion of the eye just coming into the uh, field of view. This area of transition from cornea to sclera is known as the limbus area, and an area that will be examined later is the trabecular meshwork and the canella schlam, which are located at this particular area. This epithelial folding here is part of the conjunctival uh, area that just flipped back. And so this disrupted heavy blue collagen, uh, or the collagen standing in dense blue from, uh, from this where the arrow is now indicated, this is all sclera, even though it's been disrupted. Also coming into the field of view is the ciliary body. This is the ciliary muscle as indicated by the pointer. This is the ciliary epithelium as indicated by the pointer. And these projections here, though they're not good ones, are the ciliary processes. This particular structure here, shown at the uh, top of the field of view, is the iris. We can see the pigment epithelium coming around at this uh, particular angle, as indicated by the arrow. This would be the stroma of the iris shown here. If we course in this tort medially, one can see the edge of the iris ending here. This would be that where the arrow now resides, that would be going through the pupil area. So this is anterior chamber, posterior chambers here, here. The structure shown in this area that's fragmented a little bit is the lens of the eye. Now if we course back in this particular direction, one can make out little fragments such as this. These are the zonal fibers that are going to form the suspensory ligament of the eye and they s extend from the ciliary processes to the equator of the uh, lens over uh, where the arrow now indicates. Now this little membrane is a residual membrane sort of behind the lens and just uh, posterior to the ciliary body and ciliary processes. This is, would, I think, just a remnant of where the vitreous body would reside. This would be vitreous chamber here, or just the uh, anterior most portion of it. So this area here, once again, sclera, ciliary body with the ciliary muscle located here, ciliary processes here, and then the iris extending in this particular direction. Now if we course around the circumference of the eye, one can see the epithelium located here. The ciliary muscle continues to thin out sclera uh, located here, staining this very dense uh, blue color. We're now going posteriorly in the eye. Notice even though it's disrupted, there's a change here. This change is known as the aura serrata. It's a, a uh, change where the neural elements of the retina uh, uh, now enter the picture. And we'll get by this disrupted area. What we're seeing here, right at the edge of the pointer, though not well, is the neural retina. And it's pulled apart from the sclera you can see it's separated at, at some distance, sort of split through the choroid. So we'll continue beyond this disrupted area and finally get back to where it's uh, intact. Here we can see uh, the neural retina here, extends from here to here. This intense little line, or so it appears, is the pigment epithelium. This area from the pigment epithelium to the sclera is the choroid. And then, of course, the sclera, this heavy band of collagen that's staining a dark blue. We're now uh, at the posterior aspect of the eye. 
and this is the, an area of interest. Coming into the field now is the optic disc area, the so-called blind spot of the eye. And what this shows uh, quite well in this particular illustration, note how the neural retina and the pigment epithelium thin out and disappear. Actually, the nerve fiber layer of the retina is quite thick at this particular point. These processor processes are coming from the ganglion cells and they're forming the optic nerve. And they come from uh, all sides, as it were, if one thinks three-dimensionally. So the retina stops and the optic nerve, developing optic nerve fibers penetrate through the sclera at the optic disc. You just have a few partitions of collagen holding or giving structure to the nerve and to that area where it penetrates through. This is areas known as the area cribosa. So this whole area here, as seen with the scanner, is the region of the optic disc. Now if we continue on the other side, once again, one can see the retina has reconstituted itself, the choroid's intact, and of course we have the very robust uh, sclera. And we're just coursing around uh, back the other way. Very good intact retina here resting right on the choroid and then the choroid resting on the sclera as it should be in a non-disrupted uh, specimen. Here we get into a little more disruption as we course around. We're now obviously going anteriorly. anteriorly. One can see the retina beginning to thin. And then very quickly the neural retina disappears. Again, this is the uh, area of the aura serrata on the other side. And the neural elements of the, or the neural retina disappears, though the pigment epithelium uh, and some of the supporting cells remain. And we're coursing, uh, continuing to course anteriorly. Once again, we can see the ciliary muscle coming in. The ciliary processes now, as shown here. The iris uh, coming in here, the lens, and then the, once again the zonal fibers making the suspensory ligament of the uh, lens. So that pigment epithelium continues up this far and covers the ciliary processes in the posterior aspect of the iris. We're now approaching the cornea, which would be up here. This is the area of the limbus. Here you can see that trabecular meshwork and the canal of Schlamm uh, there. So this has to be anterior chamber. This is conjunctival type of epithelium right here, it, uh, which would be on the interior surface of the eyelid. And then that reflects back over and this is becoming cornea once again. One can see a difference in the texture and that transparency and then the uh, layers so typical of the uh, cornea. So that's a quick perusal around the circumference of the eye. And now look at some of these regions at increased magnification and in greater detail. This is a portion of the cornea as seen at increased magnification. The arrow now indicates this epithelial layer. This is the corneal epithelium made up of a stratified, non-keratinized uh, type of epithelium, a stratified squamous epithelium. It rests on a homogeneous membrane, a modified basement membrane shown about at the tip of the pointer, referred to as Bowman's membrane. This region here is all substantia propria of the uh, cornea, made up of parallel lying lamellae uh, of collagen fibers that give it its transparency, this highly sophisticated organized uh, layering of these lamellae, plus their hydration accounts for its uh, being uh, very transparent. The cell type supporting these collagen uh, lamellae is the keratocyte. And finally, as we get to the interior, 
This is the uh, cube-like layer of cells, is the corneal endothelium, and it lies on another thickened uh, membrane known as dismase membrane, as indicated at the tip of the arrow. So this is the appearance of the cornea as seen at increased magnification. This is another section of cornea as seen with the hematoxylon and is in type of preparation showing at the tip of the arrow the epithelium that is the corneal epithelium, Bowman's membrane right underneath it that thin homogeneous layer. This entire thickness here as indicated by the arrow is all substantia propria or the stroma of the cornea. One can see the collagenous lamellae uh, as it's pulled apart in various places. You can uh, somewhat visualize that like at the tip of the arrow. And these are the nuclei of the keratocytes uh, that are these cells that are maintaining these uh, corneal lamellae made up of collagen fibers. This row of cells down at this particular point are the corneal endothelial cells and this maze membrane lies just on the substantia propria side of the endothelial cells. So those en corneal endothelial cells actually are lying on this, this maze membrane which is not very visible on this particular preparation. This particular field is a relatively high power field uh, of the human cornea showing overlying corneal epithelium. This homogeneous barrier lying where the tip of the pointer uh, now resides is a huge modified basement membrane known as Bowman's membrane and just beneath it and filling up this area we're just getting a portion of the stroma of the cornea. The uh, stroma of the cornea oftentimes is referred to as the uh, substantia propria. Also shown fairly well on this particular uh, section are the so-called uh, keratocytes, the cells within the substantia propria, these are their nuclei and, and part of the cytoplasm, lying between uh, the broad corneal lamellae made up of uh, collagen fibers that run sort of parallel to the surface uh, of the cornea. This is a relatively high magnified area of the lens of the human eye. And what this uh, uh, portion of the lens, which is taken near the equator, sometimes referred to as the bow area of the lens, shows the capsule of the lens, or the lens capsule lying at this particular location, anterior lens cells. And what's interesting about this area, it shows their incorporation and migration into the interior of the lens where they become lens fiber cells and as they migrate in and mature they elongate and finally their nuclei uh, liquefy and are lost so they may maintain uh, strange junctional complexes with one another in that uh, ball and socket type of configuration. So now that we have entered where the arrow is now getting into the interior of the lens substance, uh, the nuclei have uh, totally disappeared. But one can make out some of the lens fibers as they're streaking around in their associated nuclei. But this is taken from the bow area of the lens or the, uh, near the equator uh, or the zonal fibers are going to be inserting uh, near here. It just shows this uh, migration of anterior lens cells and their incorporation into the substance of the lens where they will become the lens fibers. This is another segment of lens uh, taken with the plastic prepared type of material near the bow area of the lens or near its equator showing uh, the anterior lens cells here 
and once again perhaps showing a little bit clearer and better the migration of the anterior cells uh, into the lens and becoming the uh, lens fiber cells. One can see the processes if one looks very carefully extending as these cells flatten and elongate markedly. And so this particular field shows quite beautifully this elongation of these cells and their continued development as they enter into the uh, lens substance. This particular in, uh, region is just a portion of the lens seen at high magnification. So this is lens substance uh, here. The nuclei of a few lens fiber cells can be made out. But these are the anterior lens cells, this layer of cuboidal cells here, a simple layer of uh, cuboidal cells. And just exterior to it is the lens capsule. So this is from the anterior portion of the lens showing you anterior lens cells in that thick overlying lens capsule. This is a transmission electron micrograph courtesy of Lynette Feeney Burns of the Department of Ophthalmology uh, here at the University of Missouri. Uh, what it, this particular figure illustrates, remember this is a transmission electron micrograph taken near the equator of a human lens. And what it demonstrates is the lens capsule, as indicated and shown by the pointer, that thick homogeneous proteoglycan type of material. Also at the very top and associated with the external surface of the lens capsule, note these filamentous structures as indicated by the tip of the arrow. These, in fact, are actual zonal fibers associated with the exterior surface of the lens capsule. Remember, this is the equator of the uh, lens. And so what else can be shown here are the uh, lens fiber cells, as it were, coming in. Remember, the anterior lens cells actually migrate and enter into the lens substance. They undergo this metamorphosis they'll lose their nuclei and actually become the lens fibers and make up uh, the lens substance, uh, that transparent material that forms the bulk of the lens. This is a, another transmission electron micrograph illustrating the ultrastructural features of more mature uh, lens fiber cells taken from the lens cortex. So each one of these structures is now being traced by the arrow and is in perfect alignment one with the other are these lens fiber cells. Note on this particular aspect the last of the degenerating nuclei. So on the right hand side, that side indicated by the arrow, that is going or in the direction of the capsule. These are the last, and they're sort of degenerating nuclei. And the cells, these fiber, lens fiber cells from this point on, as they go to the left, no longer have uh, nuclei associated with them. They sort of liquefy and disappear, leaving you with these living anucleate, sort of transparent uh, cells. Their cytoplasm, of course, is here. This dark outline you're seeing is the uh, joined cell membranes between fiber cells. Now note another additional interesting feature. At various locations along and between these fiber cells you have this ball and socket type of arrangement. So they very fit very tightly together uh, giving them some degree of flexibility and mobility. If one uh, asks the question how does when the lens changes its shape during focus uh, how do these cells maintain contact closely together and yet allow a considerable amount of mobility when you think of it in ultrastructural uh, levels and features. Well this is one of the mechanisms that allows them to move, pivot, and yet are held tightly together. You can see the process of this lens fiber cell coming in and penetrating into its adjacent one 
uh, forming this uh, ball and socket type of arrangement. Another one of these in this particular field is showing here with this uh, uh, cell that's uh, just about to lose its nucleus. One can make out this little ball projection into the other one, forming another one of these ball and socket uh, type of associations. So somewhere along their uh, length, uh, scattered along their length, these elongated lens fiber cells show this ball and socket arrangement and this is one of the features that help hold them uh, in close contact and allow for this uh, considerable amount of movement as the lens will become thin or thick depending on the uh, circumstance. This low powered field of use shows several interesting features. This would be sclera where the pointer now is, but this region up here is the ciliary body. <coughs> this being the where the arrow now resides and is pointing out is the ciliary muscle. These projections from the ciliary muscle, this epithelial type of projections are the ciliary processes. And if one looks very carefully, one can see these little fragments going across. These are the zonal uh, fibers that are going to form the suspensory ligament of the lens and just a portion of the lens uh, is shown uh, as indicated by the arrow. So the zonal fibers extend from the ciliary epithelium to the equator of the lens and form that suspensory ligament. This region here at the tip of the arrow is posterior chamber. This region is anterior chamber. This structure here is the iris, uh, and one can make out the pigment epithelium and then across the stroma of the iris at the tip of the arrow. A fairly close up feel that shows once again the lens, the lens capsule, anterior lens cells right at the tip of the pointer. This would be posterior chamber where the arrow head now resides. The pupil will be at, over just beyond where the pointer is now. This structure cutting across the field is a portion of the iris near the pupil. So this is the anterior chamber here. This is the stromal substance. And this particular band of material here is the sphincter muscle of the uh, iris. This is a high powered uh, field uh, through a section of the uh, iris uh, illustrating the pigment epithelium as indicated by the tip of the arrow. Also shown in this particular field are some of the fibers of the dilator uh, muscle as seen in cross section and at the tip of the arrow uh, occupying this particular area. The remainder of the field, this is mainly the stroma of the uh, human iris. The anterior chamber would be located where the arrow now resides, the posterior chamber at this particular location. So this is a section through the iris seen at high magnification. This particular uh, illustration shows several ciliary processes as well as shows quite clearly the ciliary epithelium. The ciliary epithelium consists of an inner layer of uh, non-pigmented cells as indicated by the uh, arrow and an outer layer of pigmented cells. Also shown in this particular field are zonal fibers extending from the basal surface of the non-pigmented cells, uh, the zonal fibers, and then will make their way to the lens and form together form part of the suspensory ligament uh, of the lens. This high power field of view shows the trabecular meshwork and the canal of Schlamm. Uh, as one will recall, the aqueous humor enters from the anterior chamber of the eye and enters these spaces, this meshwork or labyrinth of spaces uh, within the trabecular meshwork. These are endothelial lined uh, cavities 
and they finally enter and collect into the lumen of the canal of Schlamm, which is uh, shown at the tip of the arrow. Now several channels arise from the peripheral wall of the canal of Schlamm and join veins in the limbus and eventually drain into the episcleral veins. Now obstruction of the drainage of the aqueous humor gives rise to in, uh, interocular pressure that is a characteristic condition of uh, results in glaucoma. So a, there is a flow, a continuous flow of aqueous humor which is actually produced by the ciliary epithelium on those ciliary processes. Uh, it flows from the posterior chamber in front of the lens through the pupil to enter the uh, anterior chamber of the eye and once it reaches this terrecular meshwork it enters these channels from the uh, anterior chamber here, percolates its well through, collects into this tube that runs around the circumference of the eye, this canal of Schlamm, and eventually uh, there's numerous little uh, channels uh, that will join it or link it uh, to the episcleral veins and then uh, of course out into the vasculature. This is just a short clip illustrating the tubercular uh, meshwork. Remember these are endothelial line spaces on that portion of the limbus where the cornea and the sclera join. So these, the, post or the anterior chamber we located here, aqueous humor or fluid will then percolate through this series of channels and collect into this region here. And this is a longitudinal cut through the uh, Schlamm's canal or the canal of Schlamm. So this is a little bit better view on that human eye of the relationship of the trabecular meshwork and that canal of Schlamm. The uh, actual neural portion of the retina consists essentially of a three neuron conducting chain that will ultimately form the nerve fibers uh, of the optic nerve. And this three uh, neuron uh, conducting chain really is are the photoreceptors, the rods and uh, cone cells as indicated here. They then conduct the impulse that is generated uh, to bipolar neurons or bipolar cells which will then ultimately go up and uh, synapse with ganglion cells in this third of the uh, neuron chain. It is the axons coming from these ganglion cells that will form the uh, neural fiber network of the retina that as it gets to the posterior aspect of the eye actually collect together and form uh, the optic nerve and the region of the optic disc where it exits actually from the uh, eyeball. Now in addition to these three elements of the neuron change, that is the rods and cones of the photoreceptors, the bipolar neurons, and the ganglion cells, other intraretinal cells are present and they're present as either association neurons, horizontal cells, amacrine cells fall in this category, or glial cells. So there are other, other cell types uh, associated with the neural retina. Now the entire retina consists of a pigment epithelium and this three neuron chain. So there's a difference between the so-called retina and the neural retina. These are simply line drawings once again showing a comparison of between uh, rod cells and the cone cells, cone cells so named uh, even though it's not illustrated here too well they have more of a cone-like uh, shape. Nonetheless both of the rods and cones consist of outer segments these are these membranous sacs that are being, going to be shed uh, from the tops and be then phagocytized uh, by the underlying pigment epithelium so they have an outer segment, a region known as the inner segment that contains other organelles. 
the cell body which will contain the uh, nucleus and uh, inner fibers uh, as they go towards the synaptic regions that are either a spherical, when a, we're talking about rod cells, or a pedicle, where they will then synapse with the bipolar uh, neurons. The pigment epithelium will be at this location in these outer uh, segments of the rods and codes are actually sort of sit down and are enveloped uh, partially by the uh, pigment epithelium. Uh, of the retina. This particular figure illustrates the, uh, is a, actually a transmission electron micrograph illustrating the junction between the outer and inner segments of a rod, and it's courtesy of Dr. Kuabra. Uh, he's from the National Eye Institute, NIH in Bethesda, Maryland. He donated this particular uh, illustration for us. And what it shows is the inner segment here, outer segment here, of course, with its stacks of membranous discs. Just to point out that here's this modified cilium, along with its basal body, of course. Embryologically, it should be recalled that the outer segments of the rods and cones are all derived or from uh, highly modified cilia. Uh, during development. This particular illustration is simply a transmission electron micrograph, once again, of the membranous disks of the outer segment of a rod, just to give you an idea of some of the details of their morphology. This is a section through the retina along the posterior aspect of the eye. One can see the neural retina, which is extends from here to this location, as well as the pigment epithelium, which is now indicated by the arrow and characterized by the melanin pigment, and the coracocapillaris layer, uh, as now indicated by the pointer, that innermost part of the choroid down here. Now the retina consists of nine basic uh, layers. And they are the following. Number one, the layer of rods and cones. The, this area here, and one can see the little rod-like structures coming down and occasionally a little uh, more solid-looking structure, a much greater diameter. These would be cone uh, cells, those types of photoreceptors. Layer number two is this thin line here, the external limiting membrane. This zone here, and now being crossed by the pointer, is referred to as the outer nuclear layer. This layer, now being crossed by the pointer, is the outer plexiform layer. The next layer is the inner nuclear layer, the inner plexiform layer, the ganglion cell layer, these cells uh, as indicated by the tip of the pointer, the nerve fiber layer, right here, and finally, this interface right at the tip of the pointer is the internal limiting membrane. Now, it's helpful and helps one improves one understanding if you know what these nine layers uh, consist of. Now, if we look at this layer here, the layer of rods and cones consists of the inner and outer segments of the rods and cones. The external limiting membrane, uh, layer number two, is formed by the junctional complexes between the scleral tips of Mueller cells, one of the uh, supporting cells, and adjacent photoreceptor cells, that is, the rods and cones. The outer nuclear layer, which the arrow now sits upon, is nothing more than the cell bodies and nuclei of the rods and cones. The outer plexiform layer, which the arrow now sits upon, consists of the rod spherules, cone pedicles, dendrites of bipolar neurons, and processes of horizontal cells. The inner nuclear layer, which now the pointer sits upon, consists of the nuclei of bipolar uh, neurons, horizontal and amacrine cells, 
as well as the nuclei of that supporting cell known as Mueller cells. The inner plexiform layer consists once again of axons of the bipolar neurons, dendrites of ganglion cells, and the processes of some of the amacrine cells. The ganglion cell layer, which is shown uh, here at the tip of the pointer, consists of the perichary of the ganglion cells and a few scattered neuroglial cells. The nerve fiber layer, which the pointer now sits upon, are the non-myelinated nerve fibers from the ganglion cells, and there's some small neuro neuroglial cells and processes from Mueller cells also occur uh, there. Remember, this nerve fiber layer is going to uh, receive, or as it goes posterior, it will get thicker, and these uh, axons coming from the ganglion cells are going to be what forms the optic nerve. And the inner limiting membrane is simply nothing more than the vitriol processes of Mueller cells, that supporting cell, and their basal lamina. In other words, that important Mueller cells, its nucleus and cell body lies here, but it extends and forms the membrane here along with its basal lamina, and it goes all the way down here to the internal uh, uh, or the external uh, limiting membrane and, and forms a junction of, uh, forms junctional complexes with the adjacent uh, rods and cones. So the width of this cell is considerable, extending from this point to this point both the external limiting membrane and the uh, here and the internal limiting membrane gives you the sort of the span or the width uh, formed by Mueller cell. Its cell body and nuclei will be in this uh, inner nuclear layer. This is a very high powered a view of a plastic section through the retina of a human eye, showing the choroid layer where the arrow now is uh, crossing uh, uh, the particular field. This is the pigment epithelium now uh, being illustrated uh, by the tip of the arrow. These are the outer segments. This whole field here outer segments of the uh, rods and cones. This particular layer here shows the inner segments. And if one looks very, very carefully, a very fine line can be traced right at the tip of the pointer. This is the outer limiting membrane, which is uh, full by the, or, uh, made up of uh, tight junctions between the photoreceptors, the rods and cones, and that uh, interposed glial cell, the Mueller cell. So these are actually, this line is formed by junctional complexes between the rods and cones and that Mueller cell. And of course, this layer of uh, nuclei here is the outer nuclear layer and contains or consists of the nuclei of the rods and the cones. So this is a pretty dramatic high-powered view of the uh, details of the retina itself or the photoreceptors of the retina. This is an additional view of the uh, neural retina, but moving just interior to it, one can see the other layers of the uh, wall of the eye, the sclera and its dense collagen bundles here. This is choroid from uh, where the, it, it joins the uh, sclera to the pigment epithelium, which is shown here. This intense blue line is known as Brooks membrane. And these darker stinning cells are melanocytes within the choroid layer. There's an intense capillary network just beneath Brooks membrane, that huge basement membrane-like structure that separates the pigment epithelium from the remainder of the choroid. These vessels here are part of the coracocapillaris uh, 
layer, an intense network of small uh, fenestrated capillaries that actually supply the exterior part uh, or the outer part of the retina itself. Now this is a portion of the uh, retina more anteriorly as we approach the aura serrata. And one will notice there's a very abrupt junction at this point where the nervous component of the retina or the neural retina disappears. And that point is right here at the tip of the arrow. So this region or that demarcation line is known as the aura serrata. But a, note that a thin prolongation of the retina covers, as we noted before, the posterior aspect of the iris. It forms over the uh, ciliary processes as the ciliary epithelium. So the forward extension of the retina beyond the aura serrata consists only of the pigment uh, layer, or pigmented layer, and a thin layer of columnar epithelial uh, cells. Uh, as shown here, the nervous component is missing. This is a section from the human eye showing the fovea centralis. The fovea centralis is a funnel-like depression on the posterior aspect of the neural retina in direct line with the visual axis and it's indicated in this uh, rectangle, that white rectangle that's on the uh, viewing screen. Uh, at the fovea centralis, those vitreal layers of the retina which are beyond the outer nuclear layer are displaced laterally giving light an almost free pathway to photoreceptors. The central region of the fovea, which is about 1.5 millimeters in diameter, consists only of cones that are longer and thinner than elsewhere in the retina. They are closely packed, number between 25,000 to perhaps 35 or 40,000. Vision is most acute in this part of the retina. Now if one looks a little bit more carefully, one can see this is the outer uh, nuclear here. All the vitreal layers here, the internuclear layer, the plexiform layers, are all have been pushed out of the way except for this area here with a, the heart of the uh, fovea centralis. This would be the pigment epithelium at this particular point at the tip of the arrow. And these are the uh, segments of the cones here at this uh, particular point of the tip of the arrow.